We are back. Uh, Jess Clark here with Special Teams U Strength, Luke Rhodes, uh, Minneapolis Colts, Colts, I'm sorry. And we're here in the kid zone of Train Indy in Westfield, Indiana. Where we belong. Exactly. Uh, we just got back from Iceland and we apologize for the delay on the vlogs. We just didn't have enough funding to bring our camera guy with us. Uh, but right before we left, we asked a, we put out a little Q and A um, to generate some questions. And so we have five questions that we will answer. And then we're also gonna talk a little bit about training and eating while traveling. We'll go ahead and start with nutrition and training. So this is one thing that I get quite a bit with a lot of my clients that have to travel for work or travel on vacation. And um, I think it's important to pretty much designate whether or not you're actually going on vacation and taking time off from training or whether you have to travel or go on vacation and you have like an upcoming competition, in season, um, something that you're training for and you can't really afford to take time off. So again, if you're going on vacation, um, I think you should just take as much time off, right? Eat what you want, drink what you want. Don't really worry too much about training, but also don't go so extreme that, you know, you're uh, gonna feel really crappy when you come back from training. Uh, when you come back from vacation and get back into training. So just some basic guidelines when it comes to nutrition options when uh, traveling on vacation. Make sure you have some source of protein, some source of carbs, and some sort of fat when you are uh, traveling each meal. And then pretty much if you're not really worried about training, like you don't really have to worry about the types of gyms. It's more so when you actually have to travel for work. Uh, I know when we went down to the Dominican for Luke's wedding and then even when we were at Iceland this past week, um, we kind of ate and drank whatever we want, but kind of like in moderation. And then I didn't really train when we were at your wedding and then we only did one day of training uh, when we were in Iceland. We spent a lot of time hiking and walking, so that was pretty much just the only training we did. Um, but then when it comes to traveling and you know training for work, um, if you're someone that has an upcoming competition like an Olympic weightlifting meet or a powerlifting meet or you have an upcoming season such as Luke does, then yeah, you might have to find a gym to train in and you know, actually think about what you're eating. So real quickly when it comes to types of food, um, you can either pack your own food and prep your own food, which is probably the most ideal. But again, if you're traveling out of the country or you're gonna be out of town for several days, you really don't wanna lug that Tupperware around. So that's where you have to start thinking about um, eating out and then also meal prepping when you actually get somewhere. So if you're fortunate enough to get like an Airbnb, most of them have kitchens nowadays where you can actually prep your own food. So finding a quality grocery store is huge. Um, it doesn't have to be a Whole Foods, but um, I know Luke and I, we follow the vertical diet. Uh, it has very simple, easy to prep, easy to you know, digest foods. You can find red meat anywhere you go. Yeah, it's a lot of ground beef, rice, uh, leafy greens, um, and fruits. So you can essentially buy those and make it with your Airbnb. We did that one night um, where we made ground beef, rice, and a whole bunch of like scrambled eggs, and we had that for about two meals. Well, that was we kind of did that because we knew we were going to train, so we wanted to be nutrient efficient when we were planning on training because yeah. we had planned to train that morning. So that's huge. If you know you can uh, actually prep food while you're on vacation, that'd be great. Um, also, snack ideas, like if you go to a grocery store and you get like trail mix, beef jerky, um, dried fruit, uh, rice cakes are great. They're usually low calorie, high carb, so they're great to have before and after training. And then um, most gas stations now actually have some really healthy food options. So. You know, you can find any kind of like protein drink there. You can find uh, Gatorade, sports drinks. You can find hard boiled eggs, yeah. you can find nuts, you can find beef jerky, beef jerky yeah. protein bars. So um, going to a gas station and just having like an idea of what you should be eating is huge. And then also just going out to a restaurant, again, making sure that you have some sort of carb, some sort of fat, some sort of protein per meal is going to be huge. Look at the um, menu before you go. You can kind of plan out your meal based on what kind of menu they're going to yeah. serve. Exactly, and that's kind of what we did when we were in Iceland as well, was we were able to, um, you know, all the menus were posted outside so we could make an informed decision on whether or not we wanted to go in here or go to the next place. And then even if you go to like a buffet, you can you know, walk around the buffet once or twice, see what there is, so you have ideas of uh, you know, what you can eat um, 
and what the quality of food is. And then the last thing we need to talk about when it comes to training and uh, being on the road is the type of gym, all right? So if you are the type of person who just follows like a basic strength training program, um, really more focused on aesthetics and just general training, um, you know, sometimes a, ho a hotel gym is all you need. Or if you can, or if you're a member of like an LA Fitness, a Planet Fitness, um, an Anytime Fitness, like that, be, that would be more than enough. Um, if you're more into sports performance and you need Olympic lifting, uh, Olympic bumpers and Olympic barbells, uh, CrossFit gyms are probably going to be your best option. Um, they usually have the most bang for your buck when it comes to equipment, unless you can find an actual sports performance gym. But again. The next thing you need to look into is the type of equipment they have and then also what the drop-in fees are because they're everywhere. Yeah, and they're pretty much everywhere, CrossFit gyms. Uh, every country. Every so, country. If you just Google CrossFit, you'll be able to find, you know, at least five within your radius unless you live out in the middle of Wyoming. And if you're from my Wyoming, I'm sorry, but it's true. Uh, might just have to get, you know, a log from the side of the road and pick that up and get, like, your Rocky training on. Uh, but going back to fees, if you know you're going to be in one area for an extended amount of time, I would definitely inquire about multiple day drop-in fees. Most drop-in fees are anywhere from 20 to 25 bucks. Uh, if you're going to like a really, really uh, high volume uh, CrossFit gym, it might be upwards of 30. And then sometimes you can get away with just getting a shirt, buying a shirt, and that'll be your drop-in fee. Um, but again, if you're going to be there for multiple days, you don't want to spend $50 on two days of training. See if you can, you know, get a slight discount, make it forty bucks, thirty-five, whatever you can get. A lot of popular like beach destinations or mm -hmm. something will give you a week because I know most vacations are a week. They'll yeah. give you a week pass for eighty bucks or sixty bucks. Or yeah. And then on top of that, just making sure that you uh, are upfront with the owner and the coaches, uh, asking if you have to come in at a certain time when there's open gym or if you have to do a class. Sometimes. A lot of uh, gyms don't stay open just because they don't have the manpower to do open gyms, so you have to actually do a class. That may or may not be beneficial, so doing your research a little bit on what type of gym you're going to and how it's structured is going to be huge. Do you have anything to add to nutrition, travel? Um, travel is its so hard to stay hydrated, I feel, especially when you're flying. If you're flying for, if you have a 10 hour flight, yeah. it's hard to stay hydrated, especially up in the air, but planning out your hydration is easy. Um, always carry a water bottle around. They make all kinds of hydration tablets and powders and you know any any kind of of supplement like that just to keep your hydration because it's really easy to get dehydrated when you're flying and, and traveling. You're not even thinking about it. So mm -hmm. um, when you guys travel with the cold, do they provide food for you guys on the plane and then after? Yeah, so we'll have food on the plane. You know, all kinds of Pedialytes and waters, and we're pretty fortunate in that aspect. You can kind of get anything you want on our planes, but you know, even in the hotel, there's coolers full of drinks and food, and there's always a snack option available. So, do they now when you guys travel, do they prep uh, your food the day of, or is it kind of like the hotel preps it? Yeah, our nutritionist is planning and coordinating with the hotel kitchen, and they cook the food when we get there mm -hmm. for snack and dinner. And then is it pretty flexible where you can go up there and say, hey, I want ground beef, rice, and eggs, or is it... There's always some kind of chicken option, there's a beef option, there's some kind of steak, usually a fish, usually salmon, and then there's brown rice, there's a pasta station, you can kind of mix and match whatever you want, like a stir fry kind of thing, mm -hmm. a salad, a soup, kinds of like, stuff like that. Sometimes I would take a couple extra meals if it's a, you know, a night game, I'll bring a couple of beef and rice meals just to supplement me through the day because I know we'll be playing late. And I'm used to eating a couple extra times a day than just a big breakfast, a big lunch, and playing games. So. Yeah. Um, on top of that, I would say you know like healthy food options that I really recommend to a lot of my clients would be Chipotle, Qdoba, and Jimmy John's. Uh, you can't go wrong with those. Subway is a good option too, but I personally dislike Subway just because. Um, playing college soccer, uh, we would get our Subway sandwiches and they'd sit in the cooler for about an hour before we ate them. So they were like super, super slimy and disgusting. Their so, bread's not super high quality. Yeah, and their bread's not super high quality either. So uh, Jimmy John's, Chipotle, and Qdoba are my top choices when it comes to like eating on the road. Um, all right, so that leads us into our questions.
First one comes from Shane Milas. Again, if I, if I pronounce you guys' names wrong, I apologize. His question is, weight training before or after long snapping drills, and should you snap under fatigue? So Luke, I'll let you answer that since it's your realm. It's kind of a one but two part question. I mean, I personally would snap before I train. I know depending on your training style and what, what kind of, or if you're doing hypertrophy, power training, when you're doing a lot of power training, you're not really getting super fatigued, so you can kind of play with that. But when you're training hypertrophy, like it's hard to snap with a pump. You know, if your arms are, are ballooned out, it's gonna be hard to snap. So I would train, or I would snap before I train and do my drills before. Um, although like during our season, we don't practice till one or two in the afternoon, so our training is before. So this is where you gotta kind of play around with communicate with your strength coach and say, hey, and they're really good about it. Obviously, they, they've been around a long time. Hey, I got a snap later. Can I either lift after or come in early and lift or kind of play around the schedule just so that you're recovered by the time you're, you're going out to practice? Um, so for me, it's when I'm training in here, I snap before I do all my training and stuff. But during the season, I have to lift before I just, I go to practice and snap, so communicate with my coach and tell him what I need. And I'm very understanding and lets me kind of play around with the schedule a little bit. Um, and then snapping under fatigue, I think with most anything, you want to do your high skill, high speed movements before uh, any kind of fatiguing um, you know, activity. So. It's the same thing in exercise selection and prescription. Uh, Luke's gonna do his med ball work and his jumps before he gets under a heavy barbell, just because again, it's gonna be a quicker reaction, or like a quicker uh, contraction. And I think that's the same thing with snapping under fatigue. You can correct me if I'm wrong, like the only time you would really snap under fatigue is if you guys punted, uh, you know, punted away, the team fumbles, the receiving team fumbles, you guys recover and then go straight into uh, you know, a field goal. Like that would be, you know, from snap from the punt to snap from we had field goals probably what like probably a minute, two minutes. I mean, we probably had one situation like that this year, our last regular season game in Tennessee when Rigo punted the shit out of the ball, dude muffed it, our gunner made a muff it, they picked it up, we scored the next play. So it was kind of a punt, ran the whole way down, picked it up, came off the field, we scored the next play, run back out for a field yeah. goal. I mean it's fatiguing, but at that point, you should be in good enough shape not mm -hmm. to be just completely out of breath. But the excitement of the game, obviously, your heart yeah. rate's raised. Jacked so. up. Really, the most fatiguing time of the whole season is in practice when you're doing 12 snaps, blocks, coverages in a row. Yeah. You know, and a lot of teams during training camp will bring two snappers in just for that reason. Mm -hmm. During the season, it's just you and 10 reps in a row. So it's really just, just get in shape. Yeah. So recapping, uh, snap before you do any strength training, especially if it's hypertrophy because you don't want to do it during, like when you have a pump, uh, and then you shouldn't really snap under fatigue, you should already be pretty fit. Second question. Your comes, fatigue level is up to you. Yeah, your fatigue level is up to you, it depends on how hard you work uh, during the off season. Second question comes from Justin Matter. Uh, I'm a collegiate long snapper that will be blocking for the first time, any tips? Well, the first time I blocked in long snapping was in the NFL because I did snap in college, so it's hard for me to answer questions about college snapping. I know just watching the game now, I didn't used to watch that part of college football because I didn't do it, but watching the game now, snappers are are snapping and running down in the coverage because you don't have to wait till the ball is kicked. I would say, and I, I like to say this with Kyle too, like be the hammer, not the nail. When you're dialed in snapping and you're consistent, you're really not even thinking as much about the snap as you are your protection. So, you know, know who you have to block and just get it done. It's it's all about, you know, blocking is it's just a one-two, I guess. It's, you have help from your guards, which is huge. You know, they, they allow you to get your head up and, and see your guy. So I'd say blocking is a one-two and it's a little bit, you know, developing your power training and your, your anchor and your strength and your butt and your hamstrings and, and your back. And so it's really just knowing your assignment and getting it done. Yeah. All right, the next question comes from Austin Stewart. 
diet plan for an athlete looking to lose weight but put on muscle. So this is something that Luke and I talked about um, when we first saw this. I think there is a misconception when people ask this question because people always ask the same question, how do I lose weight but put on muscle? And why would you want to lose weight? Exactly. I don't think it's a question of losing weight. It's more a question of losing fat. Um, and to continue on that thought, when people say they want to tone, it makes me cringe because leaning out would be the correct term, right? Losing fat. You can't change muscle tone unless you're fatigued, right? Muscle tone is how hard your muscle and how ready your muscle is to perform an action. And if usually you lose muscle tone when one, you stop weight training or two, you're so overtrained that like you just don't have any nutrient, um, nutrient stores in that muscle. So a diet plan for an athlete looking to lose fat but maintain muscle would be something that's high protein and probably hot, moderate to high carb but at the same time like you can also put on um, you can also uh, have like a high fat diet as well so dialing in your macros would be huge if you actually really are worried about uh, you know your aesthetic look that I would definitely look into more uh, body recom so it's called body recomposition. It's essentially maintaining your current body weight, but taking those stored fats or taking those stored fat stores and uh, turning it into energy so that you can actually burn that fat. Um, so look into body recomp. Again, diet is going to be 90% of you know your performance on and off the field, as well as how you look. Um, and then the other 10% is going to be actually you lifting and performing on the field so look into body recomp and then on top of that everyone else is, you know, everyone's different so you know counting macros might work for someone just measuring food might work for someone or just being conscious of overall body weight might work for someone so uh, if you want to talk more about that go ahead and DM me um, or reach out to me and we can talk a little bit more I was reading Stan Efferding's vertical diet um, ebook and he says, the best diet is the one that you'll follow. So it's really, what are you compliant with in your diet that you can make, like consistently maintain over time? And your body, you're not what you eat, you're what you, you absorb and digest. So it's really, this is just coming from the vertical diet aspect because I've been reading about it, we've been following it, and San Efforting I think does a good job. It's it's all about what you can digest and what foods work for you. So it's play around a little bit with it. Nutrition is very complicated. I mean, I'm a big, it's, it's definitely working, like Luke said, working with the client to figure out um, what works best for them. Because again, everyone has a different work schedule, different training schedule. So, you know, you can talk about calories in versus calories out, but then you can also talk about quality of food. Um, and then on top of that, just like nutrient timing and it's not a one-size-fits-all approach for everything. It's, it's a, it depends. So uh, again, if you need more information on that, either check out the vertical diet or go ahead and get a hold of me uh, via Instagram or shoot me an email. Next question: How to get ultra strong doing CrossFit by Moaz El Saeed? Um, ultra strong. Ultra strong. So this kind of goes into. Uh, program design and a lot of people are jaded in the fact or have a misunderstanding that if you do cardio you lose your gains right well there's a lot of studies that have come out now that say you can actually get really really fit and really really strong at the same time if you structure your workout program really well um, Alex Viata he's really really uh, probably one of the experts on this he has what's called hybrid training not to be confused with not to be confused with the hybrid performance method, uh, but he talks a lot about how he was able to, you know, be a competitive power lifter, squat well over 700 pounds, bench 400 pounds, um, deadlift close to eight, and then on top of that, be able to run and compete, you know, be competitive in marathons or triathlons. Uh, when it comes to the program design, I would say you want to have, depending on how many days a week you train, let's say you're going to say, let's say four days a week, you want two days that are going to be generally strength focused, so you can do like a, an upper pull, lower push, and then flip that where you have um, an upper push, a lower pull. 
And then two days out of the week where you have more of a conditioning focus, where you're doing your Metcons, you're doing your um, you know, Olympic work before that, and then doing some sort of conditioning. Uh, to get ultra fit in CrossFit, I would say you, know, you need to make things aerobic. That's essentially the goal that we do every uh, with all our training sessions with Luke and I is, can we make our work sustainable? And then on top of that, can we maintain that for a high output? So if we're doing like a hundred wall balls, like this is our, take the, um, the CrossFit Metcon uh, Karen, which is 150 wall balls for time. If you increase your overall one rep front squat and then make your um, wall ball super aerobic where you can breathe the whole entire time, 150 is gonna feel you know super easy because you're gonna be able to breathe the whole entire time. And on top of that, that wall ball is going to feel light if you have a really, really heavy front squat. So I think it comes down more so to program design, um, making sure that your conditioning and your strength training are far enough apart if you're doing them on the same day or structuring out your week so that you have a strength day, a conditioning day, a strength day, a conditioning day. Um, and that doesn't mean you can't do conditioning on your strength days. I would just not make it super taxing, super aerobic. Yeah, anything to add to that? I mean, yeah, there's a program from Dave, Lip Dave Lipson, it's like hypertrophy training for basically CrossFit athletes. Mm -hmm. um, just able to maintain your strength and stuff through that conditioning portion of CrossFit. Mm -hmm. You know, most CrossFit coaches and programmers will have some sort of strength element before the WOD or the AMRAP or whatever it is. Um, yeah, I think you did a good job today. Yeah. Again, it's another, it depends, like you can definitely talk about if I increase my overall one rep max and the workout calls for a light percentage of that one rep max, I should be able to, you know, manhandle that weight. But then at the same time, um, there's the other side of the coin where if you just get really, really good at that movement, your, uh, and your one rep max stays the same, that you'll still be proficient. But I think the best way to get really or ultra strong while doing CrossFit is to schedule your week so that you have two to three strength days and then two to three conditioning days, depending on how many days a week uh, you actually plan on training. Um, again, if you guys have any more questions, don't hesitate to reach out. We're definitely going to try and do more of these questions. Hopefully we get a little bit more participation. Um, but again, if we don't directly answer your question, uh, if you do reach out to us, we will probably save it. So, until uh, next time. It's time to train, guys. We're going to train. Go. Yeah. Time to train. <laughs>